Celtics Reddit Podcast, episode 158. I'm your host for this episode, Celtics J, and I'm joined as I frequently am by the man who stands atop Knee Smith Mountain, the mister who gives keyboards blisters, an OG of OC, Mr. Wayne Spoony. Spoons, great to have you. How you doing, brother? I'm doing wonderful, Jay. Uh, I think that was too big of an introduction for me because we have a very, very special guest on today. I'm happy to do the introduction. Take it away. And and I'm pumped he could join us. So I've been a fan of his for a long time. We were talking about a guy who said the highlight of his summer was watching Yam Madar warm up before a summer league One of game. Them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> He's the man with the best headlines in basketball. He's so dedicated to the Celtics. He actually has Green in his name. We're here with Dan Greenberg, <laughs> aka Stool Greeny of Barstool Sports. Greeny, how you doing this evening, my man? I'm doing, I'm doing well. Thank you, thank you. I actually have a question for you because I also find myself atop the Neesmith Mountain. So hell yeah, you share an affinity for our our hyped up, prized <laughs> young second year player. Hell yeah. So uh, Ben, uh, one of our other contributors, well, really the main contributor to the podcast, uh, always laughs at how long it takes me to bring up Neesmith into our podcast <laughs> episode. So he's really going to have a chuckle. I think that's about 45 seconds. <laughs> Didn't take long. Yeah. I, no, I've been on start Neesmith since I think before the summer league. Uh, I just think he's such a good fit with the Jays, man, that even if his defense is a little suspect, Ooh. man, that shooting around those two, it's like, how do you stop it? And I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll probably get into it, but I was, I was with you when I always would think about between Romeo or Neesmith, like, cause I'm more of a, a one big in the starting five with the four shooters around. That's just my personal preference. So I went all summer back and forth, back and forth. I think I'm sort of sneaky on the start Romeo train now. I don't know. I don't want to be a prisoner of the moment, but if his shot is anything like what we saw from Vegas through, through preseason, and then the defense, I think he's a little bit more ready, you know, oh, for yeah. that versatility than Neesmith is. I don't know, man. I just, I'm going to advise Josh Richardson, don't buy, you know, <laughs> rent an apartment, don't buy a house. Cause the way that they yeah, both man. looked over the summer, I think eventually we'll see one of them crack the starting five. Yeah. I have begrudgingly admitted that if Romeo's actually like 37, 38% three point shooter, you just cannot make an argument for Neesmith over yeah. him. I mean, he's just a more complete player. It's just really the shooting that limits his ability to play with the Jays. And if, Hell, if he could shoot, man, yeah, what yeah. else is there? I mean, especially because you got more playmaking and ball handling yeah. out of Romeo. You know, we don't really see that. We started to see Neesmith score off the dribble a little bit in the preseason, but I think you can run point Romeo for certain possessions. I don't know if you can do that yet with Neesmith, but no. knowing our luck, they'll probably just start Josh Richardson and, and that'll be it. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> the last couple episodes, we've taken some time and kind of considered how the preseason has been going up until this point. Um, and Ooh. we've kind of touched on it already looking at, you know, Neesmith and, and of course the campaign for him to start, but of course we've got Romeo who's, you know, hill of, uh, of excitement is becoming a little bit more of a mountain each and every day, but overall Ooh. what have been your general takeaways from this preseason? So it was tough. Cause like we only, we had the limited, you know, opportunity to see Jalen and see Horford and just to see. You know, that new mix, obviously Smart got suspended for the last game. I walk away from it. <clears throat> there are certain areas where I'm encouraged, right? Like I think the ball movement, no matter who was in, whether it was the normal starters or the, you know, end of bench rotation guys, the ball seemed to be moving a lot better, which is great. Um, at the same time, there were moments I still see the same 2020 Celtics, right? I still see a lot of the same issues that plagued them last year. And I, I think it's realistic. It's, it's important to be realistic to where there are some new faces. There's a new coach, a new system. 
But the core guys there are the same core guys that we saw last year. So you still saw the same scoring droughts with the second unit in the second quarter. You still saw, you know, some iffy perimeter defense. You know, Cantor was still a disaster in pick and roll coverage. So, like, I can't imagine that what we see when the games are real and the full normal rotation is there on Wednesday night, we're still going to see the same issues at times. I just think my I'm more confident that they have a more adequate depth to, you know, maybe spell some of those scoring drops a little bit. Whereas now we won't see a quick 8-0 run balloon into a 20-2 run because, you know, they're playing semi ogile 15 minutes a night. <laughs> right. So nothing against him. It's just, you know, they have they have real NBA depth now. So I'm encouraged with that. I'm encouraged with how they shot the ball from three. You know, as a as a team, I think I looked it up the other day. They were a top ten team, both in makes and you know percentage from three, which you know is a question heading in because we don't know what Schroeder's going to look like or, or Richardson from deep. But I'm encouraged, but I'm I'm still holding off. Like, let me see it for a stretch just to make sure that you know some of the bad habits Ime has sort of beaten out of them because we still saw those at times. So, Greeny, let me ask you one follow up on that. In in considering the the three young guys that are getting the most attention right now being Peyton Pritchard, mm-hmm. Romeo, and Neesmith, which of those three has stood out the most to you as far as most likely to have a long tenure as a Celtic? Um, and perhaps who are you looking at as the most likely to end up in a trade for perhaps another big star? Well, if it's if it's a trade for another big star, they'll probably have to give up all three. Like, that's, I mean, I, I just Fair. don't. It just depends on what that package will be, right? Like, if it's if you have to give up Jalen, you probably won't be giving up, you know, uh, you know, Neesmith and Romeo. So it, it kind of all depends. In terms of who I think has the longest tenure, I would have to say Peyton Pritchard, just because of how the position looks, right? Because outside yeah. of Smart. You only have Schroeder for, you know, one guaranteed season. Um, You would think, you know, if Richardson has his extension for next year and then the two J's are still there, that you are a little bit repetitive. So I could see them having to flip one of those to upgrade for a position of need. And you can't, I mean, you can't replace that shoot. I mean, Pritchard is automatic from 35, 40 feet. So, you know, I would say probably him, but... I think we're all we all reserve the opportunity, you know, the right to reserve judgment until we see what Romeo and Neesmith look like with a real role, yep. which you know they should get given how they've they've played this. Pre-season. The time is now. <laughs> yeah, That's damn right. And uh, so you you touched on well, one thing I'll say that really looked like the 2020 Celtics is the fact that we never had all of our players available. <laughs> so <laughs> what, yeah. PTSD, whoa, whoa, but whoa. so. Yeah, you hit on a a bunch of the trends that I think everybody's kind of identified uh, from the preseason ball movement does start is starting to look a lot better. I do think the guys are playing harder. Romeo shooting, I think you could put in Grant looking skinny looking a little more mobile. Uh, What are like what's a trend that you are confident will see continue into the regular season? What is a trend that you think is kind of fluky? weird preseason this um so i think the 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 one i think will translate over is their assist percentage yeah but then i think their fluky one was their assist total right so they were their assist per game was low in the preseason i think it was like 23 24 a night which obviously if you have better players taking those shots chances are yeah those numbers will be higher what I think sticks, though, is their assist percentage, which was around, I think, 68%. And for okay. that, I say, okay, if the ball movement is real and people are going to be looking pass first, pass up, good shot for great shot, all that good stuff, I would think that they'll have a relatively high you know, assist percentage. I'm pretty sure – one of you might be able to double-check this on me, but I'm pretty sure they were like bottom – third maybe even like worse than that in terms of assist yeah. percentage because obviously right like if guys are missing shots that's going to impact your numbers but there were so many games where we saw you know high field goals made with low assist numbers because guys were just going isolation so for me like i don't care what 
you know, when I'm watching these preseason games and I see they're only 22, 23 assists, like that doesn't bother me because did you make the right, the right pass and, you know, Wancho misses a corner three or something like that's fine. It's more, what is your ratio of how many of your baskets are actually assisted? And that tells me that like, okay, this is an email system change. We're seeing less because there are going to be times when we see Tatum go isolation or we see Jalen go isolation. And I think that's okay. For me, it's all yeah. about, you know, doing it in moderation. You know, when it comes to Tatum, he's not a, an incredibly efficient isolation scorer. Like he's just, that's just not what he is. But at the same time, like when you need a bucket, I think we'd all be in agreement that like give the ball to Tatum and let him make the right play. So it's just finding that right balance. So for me, I'm hoping to see the assist percentage carry over. Yeah, and one thing I think we might see in tandem with that is we've been really turnover heavy, and I think mm -hmm. that's been a function of just people trying to move the ball, making plays they're a little uncomfortable with. I would be okay if we're a little – I'd rather be a little turnover heavy mm -hmm. and pass heavy than what we saw last year where it's pretty low turnover, mm -hmm. but it's because we don't attempt to pass for three straight possessions. Now, let me ask you something about because I'm with you on that. Yeah. But there's definitely a difference in the types of turnovers I think we've seen this preseason, right? Yeah. Like the ones coming off overpassing, okay, I can live with that. The ones where you can't even like inbound the basketball or <laughs> you're just like, you know, or, or you're just, you know, you're dribbling it off your foot. Like that's the stuff that you would hope at, that's just rust that as they get into yeah. the swing things. But, you know, I think, you know, turnovers are tricky because, you know, you obviously – depending on who you're playing, if you're playing a team that like can't really score in the half court and you're just gifting them points in transition, that's obviously, you know, an issue. If you're playing a team like Milwaukee and you're just turning it over, I mean, they're going to, you know, Giannis is just going to, you know, kill you in transition Crush before it. you even know what happens. So I just think it just depends on the type of turnovers that I, I'll be able to live with. Yeah. So, Greeny, uh, you know, we've we've touched on a couple of the different players that have stood out to us here. Um, and I actually, I, I want to pivot. We're the Celtics Reddit podcast, so we like to to pull a lot of a lot of our uh, prompts for for discussion right from the the sub itself. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've got a couple of comments here from users, specifically looking at Ime as coach. And so, um, I'm going to read a couple of these comments, and then I want I want to get your riff on that. So the okay. first one we have is from user Masuro one. So I guess all the talk about players not complaining to refs and letting Ime mm. do it was just talk. Um, so let's start way. with that <laughs> one. And, you know, cause that was kind of the talk coming right out of training camp and mm. getting into preseason was Ime didn't want to see all of the bitching and moaning and all the complaining. He said, leave that to me. Um, we've seen mm. one player get benched. We've seen another player not. Now, granted, they're on two different ends of the spectrum performance-wise, but what's been your take so far on that narrative coming out of training camp? So I, I was with – I'm with that person right away. Uh, you know, I, when, when Tatum got in his little issue, uh, I think it was, um, it, was in the, it was in the Toronto game, I believe, if I remember correctly. But, you know, right away it was like, oh, well, nothing really happened. And then when we saw Grant do it, you knew right away he was going to get pulled. It's the second he took that time out. So I like that he's holding them accountable, but I think for it to really matter, he also has to do it with everybody on the roster, regardless yeah. of what your role is. Like, like it's going to suck if we're in, you know, a one possession game and he does that for Tatum. But like at the end of the day, you know, I think about it like my dogs, right? If I don't ever correct my dogs when they do something, you know, messed up, they're never going to learn. If, if Tatum or Jalen or Smart or, or Al, whoever, the big time starters, if they just keep, you know, getting a pass with it, then they're never going to stop doing it. So I'm interested to see if he has the stones to do that. Like, let's say we're in the fourth quarter against, you know, Brooklyn or something, and it's a, you know, one or two possession game and, and Tatum drives to the hole and gets fouled, but it's not called and he flails his arms and gets attacked. Like, what does he may do? Because if he wants to be consistent, he'll take him out. Yeah. So I'm curious about how much of it will be situation, how much of it will be, you know, kind of like, you know, when Popovich would like, if the Spurs start slow, he'll take an early timeout and sub all five of his starters out to prove a point. Like, I'm curious to see if Ime will do something like that with Tatum if he's like complaining in the first quarter, whereas if he lets it slide in the fourth. Um, but I'm with that user. I, I think that, 
we have not seen this, you know, they're still doing it and we're hoping yeah. for a reaction from Ime. We haven't gotten to the point where they're just not doing it, but I, I think that's maybe a tall ask for, for us to maybe as fans think that right away, they're just never going to complain when they've been serial complainers. And it, it makes me think of when, when Doc was still building his rapport and relationship with Paul Pierce uh, back mm-hmm. when, and I remember there was one particular game where he ended up benching Pierce and it became like the overwhelming narrative, but it was after that point that they seemed to kind of actually get on the same page and, and Pierce got sort of more fully engaged in that leadership role. Mm-hmm. Um, granted, Pierce and yeah, Tatum, different dynamics, think- but... Yeah, and I always felt that, like, in post-game, Doc, he was willing to take that fine, right? The Brad Stevens approach, he avoided that like the plague. Like, he never wanted to, you know, call out officiating in press conferences. I'm interested to see how Ime handles it because you can't be like, let me complain, let me take the brunt of it, and then, like, not do that publicly. And I feel like when we had seen teams do that, in playoff series against the Celtics, we was like, oh, now you got to cry to the refs. But like, you know, what is his, what is him fighting for the players look like? Is it, you know, screaming and losing his mind during a game and getting a tech? Is it, you know, pulling up a, you know, like if you looked at the, the free throw difference in this Miami game, I mean, it was rather outrageous for two teams that had very similar, you know, approaches. I think it was like a, like a 29 to 16 free throw made difference, just something, you know, the attempts were relatively the same. So, you know, I just, I'm curious of what his response actually looks like. If he's going to say, you guys shut up, I'll handle it. Well, what does that even mean? So that actually leads right into another comment right from the the subreddit from user King of Pants. Uh, And he commented, I haven't paid much attention to Ime, but it doesn't feel like he has much of a presence on the sidelines either. Brad was never as hostile as someone as some people would have liked, but he is constant conversations in constant conversations with the referees at least. I'm curious to see how Ime develops as he gets more comfortable. I would mm-hmm. imagine we probably haven't seen all of the 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 swag and sort of energy and enthusiasm that mm-hmm. Ime is going to bring to that sideline, but it also seems like he's trying to come in and kind of play the sort of subtle and low key role off the bat. Yeah. And I think obviously the, the types of games that we're seeing probably play into it. Like he's probably, you know, you, you guys and myself, I'm all jacked up for a preseason game, (laughs) but for them, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm losing sleep over, you know, Jabari Parker passing to Garrison Matthews with (laughs) 2.2 seconds, all that junk. But for him, he's probably like, you know, I don't need to blow my load in the second preseason game against, you know, the Orlando Magic. I, for, for me, my biggest pet peeve to this day is when people would complain about, oh, you know, the players are playing like dog water because Brad isn't motivating that. Like that, I just hope we don't have to deal with with Ime. And I don't even need him to like motivate the players. I just hope that like now that we have a different coach, that we can maybe evolve from that sort of analysis of maybe why they're playing terrible. Like it's okay to say it's the players who aren't, you know, motivating themselves or coming out ready. Like I think when it comes to Ime, I just want, I care more about his system. I care more about his rotations and I care about, you know, what is he going to do to limit this, you know, complaining, you know, issue. But for me, I don't need him losing his mind on a preseason game. Like that's for me to do. I think is is probably where I'm at. It will be interesting and when I he gets will. that first tech, though, because I feel like you know you're not really you haven't really gotten the the buy in from your players until you get your, your first tech on their behalf. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like like what I want to see is if you know Tatum goes gets clearly gets foul. He he shrugs his arm like we all hate. Like I want to see Ime lose his shit just to prove a point, and that's why I'm hoping that like it can happen in in a first quarter or something where right away, like he can just say, look, this is what I'm willing to do for you. If you buy in, like, let's just, let's just be on the same page here. Um, But I just, I just think, you know, he's a, he seems like a quiet dude. He always seems like, you know, a reserved, you know, professional as an assistant. So I just think as he gets more comfortable, maybe halfway through the season, we'll probably become, you know, see him become more, you know, animated. I'm trying to remember, you know, what it was like when Brad first, you know, took he over. He was slow I, to warm up on he, the sideline. Oh, yeah, and he's, he's so, he, that's just like his mentality. You know, he's that got that Midwestern charm. So I'm hoping that Ime has a little bit more swag and, you know, 
because he's a player will understand sort of, you know, how that relationship works, but it's just still such a huge unknown just because we haven't seen it. I feel like too, like a lot of the coaches as well as just like new players, you kind of have to earn your bones with the refs too. Like you kind of have to Ooh. give a little bit of a, a grace period as they get to know you and you get to know them. It seems like, you know, yeah, and that's why I'm hoping that, like, you know, he'll know what to say based off his, you know, I mean, he's been an assistant for forever. I'm sure he can pull some stuff from Popovich and, you know, you know everything that he's learned through his years as a player as an assistant. But I also think that, like, it'll be weird for him, I can imagine, to, like, get that first tech as, as a head coach just because, you know, you want to send a message, but you don't want to burn bridges, I would imagine, of, like, okay, now – you know, we can't ever cause a shitstorm because, you know, it'll work against them in the long run. But certain, I feel like certain coaches find a way to find that balance. So my guess is he has enough contacts within the league where people will show him the ropes. Yeah. And, and speaking of the preseason, not, you know, them not really caring about the preseason, we are very close to the start of the actual regular mm. season when games do <laughs> count. So why don't we move on and kind of let's uh, have a little general discussion about what we want to see, what we will see as we move into the regular season here. So I think the Celtics are kind of in a weird spot this year, right? We've got these two young stars. We've certainly upgraded the roster, but I don't think we're championship contenders yet. So what would you perceive as a, a successful season? Um, and your dogs, if they want to chime in too, that's cool too. They just got let out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Greeny, what, uh, who let the dogs out? Let me tell you. Oh, had to, had had to happen. Cut that. Had to happen. Ben, cut oh. that. <laughs> uh, what's a successful season for you? Is it second round, co competitive second round? Is it 50 wins? Is it just the young guys look a lot better? Is it Eastern Conference Finals? I mean, what are you kind of looking at as benchmarks? To be honest, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of everything you just listed, right? Obviously, my personal, and this is just me, Given the roster, given the, the progression where I expect to see, my expectations would be top three seed and Eastern Conference Finals, or, or I'll preface that by saying, if you're playing a, a healthy Brooklyn team in the second round or first round, however they shake out, you have a competitive series with that trio. Because obviously, yeah. you know, if they have all three guys healthy, they're, they're going to be the favorites to make the finals. So... And we would have to see how the seeding shakes out. But for me, it's a team that competes every game, competes for a top three seed, and is, is a, get, gets back to a team that I think we all know they can be. And it's just they have the talent to compete with anybody in the conference. So it's just a matter of can they make that transition from potential to actually produce it? Yeah, and I'll say like, we Jay and I talked about this at length last episode, but you're not a contender until you are, right? Like Milwaukee lost in the first round last year and then they won the finals. You just got to kind of get yourself in the mix and see what happens. And I think everyone's saying Tatum's going to take another jump. Well, his only jump is into the top 10, right? Yeah. So if all of a sudden we've got a top 10 player and Jalen Brown, <laughs> and Jay's going to bring top, top five. five, right? Sorry. I apologize. I take Put it some back. respect on Tatum's, and, on Tatum's cut, yo. <laughs> He can get there. He, he, yeah. he has the potential. I mean, is that really worse than the Suns last year? I don't know if it is, you know? <laughs> so let me phrase it like this to both of you. Do you feel like they have the potential, barring let's say they finally have a postseason run with, you know, their normal health, like th they're ready to roll with, you know, uh, a normal, you know, available roster. For me, their ceiling is probably to be what Milwaukee was, where They'll probably need a break or two along the way of guys maybe being hurt. You'll probably need a little bit of luck, like with KD's toenail being on the line. But if they, if those opportunities present themselves, the Celtics have the talent to take advantage of that and make a deep run. Whereas they're not the same tier as like a Milwaukee or Brooklyn this year, now that Milwaukee's done it, where like they can be a favorite no matter who's in front of them. The Celtics, I feel like they have the talent to take advantage of their opportunity, but they're prop, but I wouldn't put them as like a betting favorite, everybody healthy, everybody's best foot going forward. They'll need some breaks, but
but they're not a team where I feel like if they play to their potential and they get those breaks, they still can't get over the hump. I don't think they're like that. Yeah, they're not the Knicks. <laughs> right. <laughs> they got it all figured out. Yeah. So and I, I'm kind of on that same that same train of thought as far as considering what their potential for success could look like if things break well. I mean, I've been not very shy about my enthusiasm for Marcus Smart as a starting point guard in that yep. I in, in what I've observed since he's come onto the Celtics, I think he's a guy that could still take sort of one of those like late blooming steps forward um, into just a, a higher level of overall performance. Um, but mm-hmm. even if it's just the refined role where he becomes more efficient and just a better decision maker in the flow of the, the natural offense, that might be enough to, to take this team to another level in the playoffs. Cause we've seen, he's one of those guys who every single year seems to be able to, to take it up a notch when it matters the most in big games. And then in big yep. series, um, I think it comes down to, there's been a lot of talk about the relationship between the Jays and I'm not so much worried about whether they're best friends and all that kind of stuff. Like they've done, I think a good job of sort of just addressing that in a, in a simple and casual way. Hopefully that won't be an ongoing narrative anymore because it's kind of ridiculous, but I am interested to see how their chemistry moving that ball with each other in the offense, both being sort of prime focus points for that attack and seeing how they play off of each other. I don't necessarily need to see them doing like, you know, I, I know John Carlos has come on the show in the past and talked about um, the Jays in pick and rolls with each other. Um, Spoons is sometimes mm-hmm. argued maybe not in that same, you know, enthusiasm. I'm not really concerned with necessarily what they're doing, but just that them being on the court together benefits both of them and that one of them succeeding isn't, isn't coming at the expense of the other one getting opportunities. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to be interested to see how that shakes out. And I think if they find that balance and maybe Marcus is part of that equation, um, maybe it's having Horford back where he's helping to facilitate more. But in either case, I think that ultimately mm-hmm. will determine where this team ends up because you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to have them both on the floor and both be lethal options where, you know, yep. similar to how you've got New Jersey where you can load all up on Durant, but then Harden's going to go ballistic and there's just nothing you can do about that. New Jersey. I love it. New Jersey. To your point, though, I think last year I was recently in New Jersey, and so I was having flashbacks. Brooklyn. Brooklyn now. First, last week, last week I'm throwing shade at Orlando, and now I'm throwing shade over New Jersey. I'm starting beefs everywhere. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead, Greeny. If you look at what they, uh, their seasons last year, I think we saw a lot of what you were talking about, right? Like, both had career years. Both took those leaps to be all-star, all-NBA caliber type players, what have you. The issue was, for the most part, their depth, right? So now, entering this season, if theoretically that depth issue is resolved, and now you have Marcus Smart, who, for the first time, honestly, in his Celtics tenure, has been given a true, like, here's your role, we paid you, so you don't have to worry about your contract, we committed to you, that tells me like, okay, there should be no excuse for Marcus to not be the type of point guard that this roster will need. And I saw enough from the Jays last year to know that they can both be that, they can both be number one options on, an, on any given night, which is I think what you need to compete. Like you look around the league, you mentioned the Nets. Absolutely. You look at, you know, at Milwaukee, you can have a Chris Middleton game or you could have Giannis, you look, you know, Philly, they don't really, you know, Tobias Harris at times, but, you know, the good teams in the league, you look at at Phoenix, you could have Devin Booker, you could have Chris Paul, you look at, you know, up and down the roster, you look at those contending teams, their number one or in number two options can really be interchangeable on any given night. So for me, that was, that's the big thing that last year showed us. What we don't know is, can we get that type of production from both the Jays on any given night and actually win? Because the wins <laughs> did not sort of match up with their individual success. So that's where you have to hope the Horfords, the Schroeder, the Richardson, the development of the Neesmith and the Romeos. Like, is your depth around them going to elevate so that if they're giving you that, even if they have the exact same type of season they had last year, are you now built better to make that? a successful team as opposed to we're screwed if the Jays, you know, aren't on that night. There's no way we can win. I think will be the big thing. 
Yeah, and I'll just say, I think we do have a higher upside than a lot of these kind of fringy contenders like a Portland or something, just because we have like, Romeo's got a ton of potential. Mm -hmm. I think Neesmith's got a ton of potential. Time Lord's got a ton of potential. So I think we have kind of these prospects you don't see a lot with kind of like your Portland's and even like Dallas, you know, where the cover's pretty bare after their first, you know, handful of guys. I would agree with you, but I would say on the flip side, an issue that the Celtics have that some of these other teams don't have is like, who knows how often those guys are even going to be available. Like, right. who knows if Rob can play 70 games? We don't know. We haven't seen it, right? Like, who knows if Romeo can play 50 games in a season? We haven't even seen it. So, like, yeah. talent-wise, they may have, you know, an edge on potential. But we're going off, like, I hope they stay healthy and actually show that potential. Because, you know, we do have as many questions as, you know, new team, new system, new coach, new roster. Like, it's no slam dunk that it gels right away. and we're one, you know, Rob injury away from being in a tough spot at that position. So, you know, it's, it's just as much of an unknown. Uh, Scott, as if you've got some, some type of clairvoyancy, you really did a nice job of leading us right into our, our next Redditor comment, which is um, from user Owen and M and said in speaking of Rob Williams, if he's healthy, we are contenders. If he's not healthy, yeah. we are pretenders. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we just saw a, a piece dropped by Lowe talking about Time Lord as one of the five most intriguing guys in the NBA this upcoming season. Um, from what we saw last year, I mean, the guy's got the potential to be really dynamite, but we're already seeing nervousness around those knees um, and, and him missing some time here. Maybe it was just taking that extreme caution, but we also haven't seen the same level of explosiveness out of him so far. Um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about whether that's more planfulness and, and from guidance that he's getting from some of the vets around just managing his body and trying to pace himself better. But what have been your yeah. thoughts so far on Rob? Um, and separate from just whether he's healthy or not, what are you looking for? His preseason was weird. You know, in the limited time we saw him, like, for me, I felt like they had a focus on him on other areas of his game as opposed to rebounding and blocking shots. It's like, we know you can do that. Like, let's yeah. see how you adapt to how Ime wants everyone to switch on the perimeter. Let's see, you know, if you can improve your defensive stance and, and keep your hands high, like stuff like that. And then he got hurt and we didn't really see him. And that was that. So it's tough to gauge on what he is because I do think I agree with you where like part of it's probably like, Load, load management where it's like, okay, we don't need you going a million miles an hour trying to block everything in these fake games. But I do think that like what he can give if healthy is like the sample that we've seen it is a dominant rim running center that changes the entirety of how they play. When, when he's not there, we see that, okay, we miss that rim protection. We miss that lob threat. But even his ability to, you know, guard guys on the perimeter and block jump shots, like he, I feel like I tweeted this in my, you know, highest stage of preseason delusion, but it was like watching him challenge shots. He changes the way guys approach taking layups at like a Gobertian level where he may not block it, but he impacts it. And he makes guys think twice when they drive the rim. We don't have another player on the roster that does that in the big man position outside of Rob. So even if he's not blocking the shots, he's impacting what guys do once they get into the paint and in the rim. That's going to help everybody. It's going to, you know, bump up transition scoring. It's going to create easy baskets. I just hope we don't see him fall in love with his jumper like we saw at times this preseason. I'm hoping that was like, let's just try to get this out of the way in these fake games. But I... I mean, it's hard to disagree with Zach Lowe. He's a smart dude who knows a whole bunch, <laughs> you know, a whole lot more than us. I just think, you know, if he can stay healthy, which is a gigantic if, there's no reason to think he can't be, you know, a top five, top six caliber center, right? Like he's not going to be able to guard Joel Embiid by himself on the block because he's human and no human can do that. But if you're just thinking of like, impact on both ends of the floor. Like, why can't he be a Clint Capella, which is like, you know, a very serviceable double-double type impact, defensive rim running, rim protecting center. Like, why can't that be what his contribution is? We've seen him do it in a limited sample size. With better passing. 
What exactly with much? Because yeah. that's the thing, right? Like even if you wanted to run double bigs with Horford and Rob, that's different than what we saw with Tyson Thompson because you could put both of those people, both those players at the top of the arc and say, run the offense through Rob at the top of the circle. He'll find cutters. Al will find cutters. You know, you can stretch the floor with Al as a three-point shooter. So the passing is like you can play him with any lineup you want because you can just – the ball doesn't – it's not like you have to avoid him on the offensive end. You can get him in pick and roll. You can get him in pick and pop and have him, you know, find off-ball cutters. So it's like those are the things where I just want him to stay healthy because I want to see like a legitimate sample size of him playing – 25, 30 minutes a night because his skill sets are things like outside of the three point shooting, like all the things we loved about 2016 Horford, Rob can do outside of the shooting. Yeah. And uh, I think what you're hitting on is Rob fits in a lot of different lineups Mm -hmm. because of his passing ability, right? He's not like uh, DeAndre Jordan back in the day where literally all he could do was catch lobs. He has some, some pop with the ball in his hands. So Thinking about fit and who should play around Rob or really anybody, what are some? What's one lineup you're like, man? That's going to be fun as hell to watch. Uh, other than maybe the starters, and what's one lineup you're like, I know Emi Doke is going to roll this out. I know I'm going to cringe. I know I'm going to yell at my TV, and I know Josh Richardson's going to be involved. Yeah, I would say one I want to see. So I have two that I really want to see. I want to see. Um, the normal, I want to see Smart, Jalen, Romeo, Tatum, and Rob. Because I think that's their, eventually, that's their ideal start in five. That's where in a dream, or in Smith, like if you're an Smith guy, that's fine. But like a shooter wing with Rob at center, just because I think that gives you a really intriguing group of size. It gives you an intriguing group of switchability in terms of you know, you have one through five of guys that you could have initiate offense and run the point. I think that's a great defensive lineup. What I am interested to see is if you swap out, um, you swap out Romeo for Schroeder and you have a backcourt of Schroeder and Smart, because Schroeder guards 94 feet. So I just want to see what that looks like of them just terrorizing opposing backcourts. And if you are lucky enough to get by one of them on the perimeter, congratulations, Robert Williams is meeting you at the rim and you're probably not going to get that shot off. So I'm interested in that because I think they'll be able to play really fast because Schroeder, I mean, he's just, he's up and down. But I really want to see any sort of lineup combination that have Smart and Schroeder together, knowing that offensively they're not going to be able to hit shit from outside. But like just to make life hell on opposing guards defensively, like. I want to see what that looks like for stretches. That would be the lineup we roll out against teams like like the Suns with Chris Paul and and uh, and Booker there, having those two out there. Even That'd be Brooklyn, a right? Even Brooklyn, right? If Harden's going to be a primary point guard and Kyrie's on the floor, you know, I want two, you know, ball hawks on them just because, you know, we know Smart is in Harden's head, and I just think Schroeder <laughs> has that level of asshole where, like, I mean, he'll just, you know, men- play mental warfare on you. And I just, I love how he guards 94 feet. That's just, I think that's my favorite part of him so far. Schroeder and Smart are such the same in that, like, if Smart was on, like, Milwaukee, I would absolutely hate Definitely. his ass. And Definitely. Schroeder, I despised him when he was with Atlanta. And now, like, it took me 30 seconds of him playing for the Celtics to be like, I love this dude. Look at, he's all over everybody. It's awesome. He's like knocking the yeah. ball out of people's hands when they're like, turn it over. I, I love that dude now. There was, that, there was one play in their game against the Heat. I think it was in the second quarter. Um, he missed the layup. And then, you know, yeah. the, the Heat going the other way, he busts his ass back and tapped. I think it was either Bam or something. Tapped. The heat, the ball from the heat player uh, uh, right around like the three point line to to spark the turnover. And it's like he could have just like jogged back. It's preseason, but he busts his ass and he got back and he made a play. I'm sure he was pissed at himself for missing an an easy layup. So like those are the type of things where when we think of when the Celtics were at their best, it's they had guys that gave a shit and actually competed on both ends. My hope is that he brings his com- that compete level and that that just rubs off on everybody. And I've like seen yeah, the he- way that the ball moves out of his hands just when he's he's passing to create too. That was something that kind of took me by surprise because 
I've never watched him super closely with other teams, um, but mm. I've always thought of him as kind of like the guy that can create off the dribble and get to the basket. But I, I never thought of him much as as a a passer or a creator in that way. But I've seen some pretty good indicators, especially early on his chemistry with starters. Um, I haven't yep. seen that same synergy with the bench yet. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about that in the previous pod, uh, the balance between like Pritchard and and uh, and Dennis Schroeder in that regards, where it looks like Pritchard's probably the guy that's going to be able to keep that bench more stable at times. Um, mm-hmm. But the guy that's likely going to be able to to slot in with those starters and have a bigger impact, uh, like you're pointing out, would probably be Schroeder. And that's what he's here for. Yeah, and I think I'm with you. Like, as I really noticed it in the opener, the preseason opener in that first quarter where, like, nobody even wanted to shoot the ball. They were just, like, overpassing so much. <clears throat> so I think part of it is, you know, is the honeymoon phase, right? Like, a new guy and a new team. Like, everyone wants to play the right way. What I want to know is, is, like, a month from now, let's say, you know, the, you know, what does it look like when – you know, he's on the floor with the second unit and they can't score. Is he still going to be a willing passer? Is he going to have to, you know, feel like he needs to be the guy and take over and be, you know, the the scoring option on that second unit? So it's like, I'm with you. It's definitely shown up in these first preseason games. But I do wonder, like, how much of that is, like, the vibes are great. Everyone's feeling good. Everyone wants to be on, like, their their best behavior, so to speak, and, like, you know, what happens when they hit that first snag of adversity? Like, do people crater back into bad habits? Or is there really a system switch where Ime has gotten through to these guys and this is just how they're going to play? I think that's what we all want. We just like, let me see what it looks like when things aren't going well, if you're still playing that way. When people stop being polite. And st- right, that's what it's <laughs> like. Start it's getting like, real. You know, the first time, Millennial the first references time, you know, all through and through, baby. <laughs> Making it like, up. what are we going to do the first time Schroeder feel like he only can't gets four shots in a game? What's going to happen? Is he going to come out the next night and still, you know, be looking to pass first? Or is it going to be like, well, I didn't really shoot in our last game. Like, I'm here. I need to play for a new contract. Like, I want to, you know, I need to score. But I also think it's important that, like, he be flexible based on what the team needs in that moment, right? Like, if they can't score for the life of them, I have no problem with him trying to initiate offense, get into the paint, you know, utilize his floater. But if he's on the court with the Jays, like this will be, does he suffer from the same issues that Smart did at times where, you know, he's taking shots where you hope that he kept moving the ball. Mm-hmm. So part of it will depend on the lineups that he's with and the situations on any given game. But I, I am with you. I was impressed. Like I did not expect him to come – right away and be such a willing passer. But I do wonder how much of that is just like a honeymoon phase. So in in thinking about honeymoon phases, I think there's an entire team and organization that's been going through a honeymoon phase. And I'm clearly talking about the Knicks who had a pretty good season last year. Um, Some have maybe suggested that they had a better season than us. I think those who suggest such thing are crazy. And that's just my personal thought. Um, And that person may be in this particular conversation right now. Um, That's right. I'm looking at you, Spoons. I know. (laughs) But in in considering that, um, the additions that they've made with Kemba Walker and then the the old girl, you know, we took out on one or two dates, Evan Fournier. uh, Does that combo with the Knicks um, and, and Randall over there cause any concern for you as far as a matchup with us? Not just for opening night, but um, looking ahead towards playoffs and stuff like that. Um, I think it just depends on what your views of Fournier and Kemba were when they were on the Celtics, right? So for me, I'm not someone who thought that those players were washed up or bad or, you know, not good. So the fact that they're on the Knicks, I think, makes them better, right? Like they're upgrading from Alfred Payton to Kemba Walker, who's healthy, quote unquote. Like that's a legitimate upgrade. They're a team that needed any form of consistent outside shooting. You know, I think it was unfortunate, you know, with with Fournier getting COVID and all that stuff, didn't really catch his rhythm. But we know, like, he's a a Celtic killer, so he's going to shoot the ball great on Wednesday. Like, just accept that. Where I think is getting overlooked is now because they're not on the Celtics, the same flaws that existed while they were in Boston, like, now, I guess, no longer exist for the Knicks. They still can't play defense. (laughs) 
Yeah, like nobody's now going to target Kemba in a playoff series or whatever because he's a Nick and not a Celtic. Like that I don't agree with. My thing with the Knicks, and same as how I feel about the Hawks, is it's very reminiscent of the Isaiah Thomas Celtics to where in the regular season, the Knicks played harder than every single team they played for a full 48. That's a Tibbs team. That's just what they did. So that bumps up like you're going to be more competitive. You're going to win games that maybe, you know, you shouldn't. And once we got to the playoffs, what happened? The same thing that happened with the Isaiah Celtics against the Hawks, where once you're in the playoffs, everybody's trying hard. That, that effort difference no longer matters. Now they enter a season where they're not surprising anybody, right? Like nobody's, nobody's going to take the Knicks or the Hawks lightly on their schedule. You know, the Hawks have a little bit more high-end talent, so they're a little bit different, but it's the same thing. We don't know how either of those teams respond to being the hunted. To where, you know, now they're not sneaking up on you. And now there's real expectations, right? Like people are talking about the Hawks, like they could be a, a two, three seed, make a conference finals again. Like this is who they are. Well, what happened when we saw what happened with the Celtics when they were loaded with talent and they were, you know, they had all these expectations to be a championship team and they cratered in, you know, that 18, 19 season. We don't know what either of those franchises will do now with these lofty expectations. So, you know, I think it's, if you look at the, the Atlanta, the Knicks, the Celtics, the Heat, they, they're all jumbled together for me. You could tell me any of those teams will be the third seed. You could tell me any of those teams will end up playing in the play-in because they all have their own unknowns, right? For the Celtics and the Heat, it's like, okay, they have more pr NBA proven talent in terms of like, They've lived up to expectations pre in previous season. Last year, both the Heat and the Celtics were decimated with injuries and COVID. Like, that's how you can help explain their season. When you look at the Knicks and the Hawks, it's like, you know, on paper, they, they have a good roster, but everything is so – like, just because you were successful one season does not mean it automatically translates to the next season. And I think that's what – that's what they're going to learn. You could tell me they come through and, and who we saw last year really is who they are because, you know, Trey Young is an all NBA player and John Collins is, you know, putting up all-star numbers while not being an all-star, all that stuff. And, you know, they buy into Nate McMillan. I'm, I'm willing to concede that, that that's a possibility, but we just don't know because they haven't entered same with the Knicks. They haven't entered this season with expectations that they're going to be good. So until they do that, like, I think it's fair to be skeptical. So yeah. I want to, one thing, I, I, hold on. One I, I want us to go around, around the horn real quick. I, I got one, I got one final question that I, I'm going to kick to spoons to kind of, uh, to maybe give us our, our, final, our final talking point for the, the segment here. But um, I'm looking for everyone's kind of like your favorite take or anticipated take going into this uh, season opening game. I know for me, I want to see, Jason Tatum just explode and go ballistic like super saiyan mode because ultimately he's playing the team and and Julius Randle who ultimately took money out of his pocket um and I I just want to see him go completely bullshit on the Knicks and demonstrate that that decision that got made last year as far as who was ultimately all NBA and who wasn't uh was a mistake so I know going into this opening night that's the that's sort of the the narrative that I'm chasing and following for my own enthusiastic purposes uh where you, are the rest you of you guys want at? him to have a you want him to have a trey young moment right where he became <laughs> the villain of madison That's square right. garden they don't want it with they don't want it with him they don't yeah, yeah. uh one thing i know is going to happen and it is not a narrative i want to see happen is i know kemba is going to have a good game that's what i was gonna and say, i yeah. know we're never going to hear the end of it all he's, even if he's not that good for the rest of the season we are going to never hear the end of that uh, I, I'm super interested to see, cause I saw, I think Horford is probably not going to play. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm interested to see who the fifth starter is. I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah. My heart, my heart wants that to be Romeo. My head says it'll probably be Richardson, but you know, just <sighs> because he's no. a vet. <laughs> One storyline I want to see, can they match the Knicks defensively with that defensive intensity? Cause I think. That's going to be ultimately the thing that separates these two. Because <clears throat> I think, you know, 
if you remember their game, uh, their matchups last year, there was that one game we got killed by 30. Then there was the other game where we killed them by 30. And then there was the the third one, which was like that close. I think it went to overtime, if I remember correctly. Um, but for me, it's like, can – now that R.J. Barrett's outside shot looks improved, now that they have Kemba and Fournier who will be motivated, can you match them defensively in terms of are you – Gar- are you making them feel you defensively? Like, are you giving good ball pressure? Are you making it tough for them to initiate offense? Because if you don't, you're not going to be higher than them in the in the standings. You're just not. I think, you know, what is not a fluke with teams that usually make a jump, and this is true of teams like Utah and Phoenix and Milwaukee, when they made their leaps, it start- and even of the Celtics too, right, during the, the Brad years, It starts on the defensive end. If you can prove that you have a a top five elite defensive team, you're going to be a top four or five seed. We don't know if the Celtics can get back to that with whatever this new EMA system will be, but you sure as shit know that Tibbs is going to have that team locked in defensively. They're going to be ramped up playing at home, MSG, crowd's going to be going crazy. So I just, I'm interested to see, can they match that energy right away? Or are we going to have to see an 8-0 Kemba run, early timeout, crowds going crazy, and now you know, you're know you battling uphill? I really want to see their best players, the smart Tatum and Browns, come out and just lock down their guys defensively. That's what I want to see. The game thread for that evening, if that's the way it opens up, is going to be a complete nuclear meltdown. Yeah, all <laughs> I know all- is, is just don't let it be a one-possession game in the fourth quarter because Kemba's going to hit the step back. Like He's yeah. going to do... <laughs> The UConn crossover step back over smart for the win like that. I know for certain. So as long as it's not a one possession game, you know, like think of all the times where we had to play Charlotte when he was there and we had cardiac Kemba, like you just knew you weren't going to stop him. That's the Kemba we had for like six months in his first year. I think that's the Kemba we're going to get, which is why I'm so interested to see like, you know, smart last year, his perimeter defense, when he had to face these quicker guards, did not look the all NBA level that we were accustomed to. So yeah. we'll know right away what his, you know, how his defense looks, because if Kemba is healthy, he can still shift around. He can still, you know, be quick with it. So, you know, if, if they can't stay in front of him, they're in for a long night. Greeny, as you constantly write in all your post-game wrap-ups, this team does not know how to blow somebody out and make it easy no. on us. It's definitely going to come down to one possession. And, um, so- and what's messed up is that's how every, like, even in the preseason, I can't even have a stress-free, <laughs> yeah, right. like, three out of their four games were, you know, last possession. Like, what are we yeah. doing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we wrap up here, just kind of one thing I want to talk more generally about kind of your role in sort of Celtics media, because I mm-hmm. think it is a unique one. Uh, I really appreciate that you kind of get in the mud and you're <laughs> constantly interacting with people on Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you, and I love how you push back against these weird ass narratives. Like, almost Ainge is like <laughs> so dumb. The dude did more trades than anybody in yeah. his tenure. Mm-hmm. And you, and you do it by your like, oh, look, the Heat are interested in like every <laughs> single player way more than us. So yeah. is, and you actually brought it up, uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier when you were talking about how Kemba no longer has any faults because he's not a Celtic anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Is it just because we're fans of the team and that's how it is for everybody? Or are the Celtics perceived in a way because they're this old historic franchise? Do you think it's because... Celtic fans are obnoxious. I mean, do you have any theories? Um, I don't know. I mean, I look at it like this. I I certainly know that I probably shouldn't take the bait. I take the bait. Like, it's very easy to bait me. Like, I'll go on a Twitter. I love it, man. For, you know, I have all the time in the world. Like, this is what I do for a living. I don't have to go to work. So, like, <laughs> you, I have the time to get mad online. So, part of it's me. Part of me, I think, is like. People know that and they know that like, you know, I'm easily baited, but I also like, that's where the fun is it. The fun for me is, is interacting on Twitter. It's coming on podcasts like this and just, you know, talking about this team with people that are as passionate, but I'm also aware that, you know, the market in which this team plays thrives off negativity, right? Like, you know, if you're, if you even resemble that, you even like the Celtics, you're just, you know, you're called the blind Homer from 
you know, Joe Schmo 7536, who's like <laughs> just regurgitating what he hears on the radio. So like always a Pat's avatar too. Right. always so like, a Pat's avatar. That stuff bothers me because like I'm hundred percent down to critique what we watch. If you can bring some substance behind it, the shit that just bothers me is like when I hear the same trolling that we hear on the radio and I know you don't even believe it or can't bring substance to what your argument is, like, oh, Romeo Langford's a bust, blah, blah. I'm like, the dude's played 50 games. <laughs> like, we don't, he could be good. He could be yeah. bad. We just don't know. And until we have a larger sample, like, yeah, I'm going to hope for the positive and hope that he works out. You can hope for the negative. And then, you know, like, a great example of this is probably my biggest fight was with the Celts ending up as a seven seed last year, right? Not good. We all agree, like, watching that game – you're watching that season, like the style of basketball and the brand they played, awful. But when I hear people, oh, Celtics suck, they can't contend, they're a seven seed. Well, where's the context around that? You know, what team in the East or in the NBA, really, if they have their top seven guys for 11 games are going to be a top three seed in the East? Like, it's not a crazy, it, you're not being a homer. It's not a crazy take to think having your better players available probably translates into what your record looks like. The same way the Heat had a middling, underachieving record, their guys were all hurt, they got healthy to end the year, guess who played out of the play? Well, in those two games, at the end of the year, we didn't have Jalen, we didn't have Rob, and then that was it. So it's like, obviously, there's context around it. That's just where I need to be better not taking, not taking the bait because I do find myself getting caught up with it. I just like... I just want to respond to you with logic of why I think the way I do. I know the second that they say, oh, well, you're just a green team homer. I know that I've, I've won that argument because that's, that's not a real rebuttal. I just think it's okay to remind people that like, you don't have to hate the team that you root for. You don't have to think everybody sucks. It's okay to be hopeful that guys turn around and, and, and perform well. I have no problem talking about when guys, I mean, two thirds of my blogs are things that they do bad in, a, in any individual game. I just choose to live my life in a way where I'm going to hope, I'm going to think the Celtics can win the title until they don't. And that's Damn just right. that's how I live. That's how it's in my DNA. Until the clock hits zero and they are eliminated, I will always believe in their talent. And, that, and, and that's just, if that's me being a homer, like I'll gladly... I'll gladly wear that badge because like, yeah, I'm not a reporter. I don't have to be unbiased. I can talk about what I feel in that moment. Like that's just, that's the reality. So if that makes, if that's different for me, then, then so be it. But I do need to be better. There are certain, especially, you know, certain fan bases. I know that I should just, just really? ignore that <laughs> and let it, let it ride. But, really? <laughs> yeah. I just, I need to be better. And I, and I feel bad because I'm like, you should just respond tweet instead of quote tweet. Like I know when I'm quote tweeting someone who says something really stupid that it's gonna like it's gonna activate the floodgates for everyone that follows me. So I shouldn't do that. But I, there's sometimes I'm just like I'm gonna ruin your mentions for like 20 minutes by just quote tweeting <laughs> this and then everybody else seeing it. It's it's the price you pay for bringing that on my timeline. Well, Greeny, I think you've done a really nice job of, of giving us about as good a a, a green. Uh, tinted mic drop as we could ask for to to close out the show. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing some of your thoughts and insights and, and having just a really fun conversation about where the team is at. Looking forward to uh, the season starting tomorrow. Um, real quick, I'd I'd love to give you the opportunity just to to shout out what you're working on and where folks can find more more of what you're doing and where you're at. Yeah, every day, Barcel Sports, BarcelSports dot com um, at Twitter, Stool Greedy. Um, appreciate everyone that clicks, interacts, you know, especially like you guys for having me on, you know, we can talk as many, as often as you guys want, both the good and the bad. If, if you need someone to, to help vent with, I'm here for you. Cause I think we're all a little on edge, right? Like we all are, are hopeful. Like somebody asked me the other day, they said, like, how are you feeling, you know, heading into this season? And I said, uh, I'm, I'm hoping for glory, but I'm preparing for pain, you know, where it's like, <laughs> I know what I want to happen, but I'm fully aware of what probably will happen. 
because it's been that way for 33 of the 34 years I've been alive. Truth. But, um, yeah. you know, you just you got to keep believing and then one day it'll work out. I'm anxiously optimistic. That's, yeah, that's how a good I describe way to it. it. That's basically the Celtic fan diagnosis right there. Like I th- I'm pretty sure it's getting added right. to the DSM five. <laughs> no, but we we really appreciate you taking the time, man. And yeah, oh, I will absolutely be using that invite to absolutely. have you on more. I can you know, you. I'm, I'm thinking Anytime. we have to definitely have them come on for one of our uh, our fan therapy sessions that we do yeah. every so often, especially when you know the the fan base is getting quite temperamental during the tougher times and the dog days of the season. My guess is that's going to happen before Halloween. If I had to guess, like that, dude, our yeah. schedule's crazy. We're like have like two home games or something nuts. Yeah. It's fucking and then boring. I saw I was I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a Lakers fan. They got seven of their first ten games at home. So you don't think people are going to be hyped? It's like, well, play a road game for me one time, like Christ. <laughs> All right, everyone. Again, want to thank Greeny for uh, for joining us this evening for this uh, episode of the Celtics Reddit podcast. And again, thank you, Wayne Spoonie, for joining us as well uh we will be looking forward to following up with everybody and sharing thoughts and insights after a hopeful uh hopefully a big celtics win game one to start the season we shall see uh until then peace everybody